What's up, and welcome to Crash Course AP Macroeconomics Edition, Video 2. Double shift rule. So this is a general rule of thumb that is good for macroeconomics. If two curves shift at the same time, then either price or quantity will be indeterminate. So if your supply and demand is shifting, that starts to counter act each other's actions so then you won't necessarily know what happens between price or quantity market types so this is an example of four different types of markets that we can possibly have so we have perfect competition monopolistic competition an oligopoly and a monopoly so a perfect competition is where all the products are the same oops that's a typo and there is no price influence because there are many competitors, buyers, and sellers, and these people all control the price. A monopoly is when there is one seller, and this one seller can control all prices. So you may remember Standard Oil from A Push. And Standard Oil, John D. Rockefeller, really consolidated all the different oil wells and businesses, and he was able to control exclusively the price of oil. Oligopoly is where there are few sellers, and there's sometimes competition. It really depends on who is in charge of certain industries. So big chicken is one example of an oligopoly. There are only a few big chicken manufacturers, and they make like 99% of the chicken we consume. And monopolistic competition is when there are many sellers, there are different products, and each seller sets a different price for a different product. So this is really when, once again, sort of like perfect competition, things get crowded just because of the sheer number of factors that are involved in this type of economics. GDP. GDP is very important. So GDP is the dollar value of all final goods and services produced in a country in a year. So there are different ways to approach this. The most common way is the expenditure approach, where GDP, represented as Y, is equal to CIGX, so consumption, investment, government spending, and net exports. So this adds up all the spending done in the economy by different households, businesses, governments, and even other countries. The other type is the income approach, and this is where you add different factors of production. So if you're making jeans, you got to add one step of cost for the denim and another step for the labor and then the sewing that goes into it, stuff like that. And GDP, while not totally accurate, is very often used as an indicator of standard of living. More developed countries generally have a higher GDP. Nominal GDP versus real GDP. So nominal GDP measures current prices and does not account for inflation, while real GDP is adjusted for inflation today, and it's expressed in constant, unchanging dollars. And a formula for shifting between these two is real equals nominal minus inflation rate. Things sometimes are not included in GDP, and this is why it's not always a totally accurate measurement. So one thing is intermediate goods, and these are goods that are used in the production of other things. So if you have a car, you're not going to count intermediate goods like tires and metal, although sometimes you can add them together to calculate the total GDP. You also have non-production transactions, including goods or financial transactions used in special markets. So stocks and real estate investments generally are not counted into this unless you're actually like buying a house, which that's just a consumption of a good. And then you also have non-market activities. These are like the black market productions and distributions, or if you own like a small family farm, obviously you might be using cash and that might be hard to be calculated. And of course we have like the infamous cocaine and marijuana trades that are often on the black market. And that's actually a lot of money that is being leaked from the macro economy as we know. And of course, for all those stay at home bombs out there, they do a lot of great work, but of course, their impact to the family and the household oftentimes is not counted in GDP as well. Frictional unemployment. So this is when temporarily unemployed workers are between jobs. So individuals, they are qualified and they have good skills, but they currently aren't working for a variety of reasons. Maybe they need to find a new job or maybe they just took a break to like be on maternity leave or paternity leave or something. So here's an infographic for that. Structural unemployment. It is changes in the structure of the labor force that make some scale skills obsolete. So workers do not have their skills that can be used in these new jobs and these jobs will never come back. 
And the biggest indicator of this, of course, is automation. When different companies start to invest in technology such as robots, different workers, especially the blue collar workers who use their hands to make different stuff, their jobs are no longer there. Cyclical unemployment. So there's always going to be unemployment. And this type of unemployment results from economic downturns. So as demand falls for goods and supply, labor generally falls too and workers are fired or laid off because they are no longer needed. And this strictly follows the business cycle model. When you go through the troughs of different types of business cycles, you start to have these types of recessions and then you will have more cyclical unemployment. But eventually, this number should go down and the economy should recover. Discouraged workers are people that are no longer looking for a job because they gave up. And since people are not counted in the labor force, the unemployment rate may sometimes be counted too low for this reason. People might not want to go into the labor force for a variety of reasons. For example, they really just can't seem to find a job anymore. Underemployed workers. So these are people who want more hours but can't get them, but they are still considered fully employed. And this unemployment rate really ignores the plight of such workers who really want more jobs, but they really can't get it. So some fast food workers are like this because they need to work more hours because they are not paid as much. Unemployment insurance. So this is a government program that partially protects workers' incomes when they become unemployed. So this is sort of like a form of welfare for people who have recently been unemployed, and it usually lasts for about six months. The labor force participation rate is workers who are employed or actively seeking employment divided by the total non-institutionalized civilian working age population. So this would include all different sorts of people that are like not in jail. So it would definitely include college students as well. Of course, we know some people, they do not necessarily need to work such as these college students. Unemployment rate. This is a rate that we talked about is sometimes miscalculated and it is simply the percentage of the labor force that is unemployed. Collective bargaining. It is a process by which a union representing a group of workers negotiates with management for a contract. So you may remember at the homestead strike, the collective bargaining ultimately did not really work out and people went on strike. And of course, we start to have different issues. So this is not much of a big deal anymore because union membership has dramatically fallen in places like the United States. The consumer price index is an index number that shows how price changes over time for a fixed basket of consumer goods. So these are common goods that people buy and might include like bread and other things. And the formula is the price of market basket divided by the price of a market basket in a predetermined base year times 100. The GDP deflator is an index number that measures all prices and is used to convert nominal GDP into real GDP. So this is kind of like the real equals nominal minus inflation stuff. And to calculate this, it's nominal over real times 100. So this adjusts for that inflation component of things. And finally, deflation. This is a decrease in price level. So it is actually the opposite of inflation. Inflation is when you know things go sky high, and this is when things start to drop rapidly. Disinflation. Disinflation is a decrease in the rate of inflation. So prices are still rising, but not as quickly as normal inflation would. Shoe leather costs. These are the resources wasted when inflation encourages people to reduce their money holdings. So you may remember, cash does not respond very well to inflation. Cash becomes less worth it when there is a lot of inflation. So people want to run to the bank to reduce their cash holdings. And as a result, the leather shoes sometimes they wear is worn down. That's where this term comes from. Menu costs. These are the costs of firms of changing prices. This comes from the term as we know that when menus they normally don't change as much in places like restaurants because, of course, it would take a lot to overhaul the whole menu. Velocity of money. This is the average number of times a dollar is spent and respent over a given period of time, and it really shows how well the economy is doing. If you have a high money velocity, normally money is exchanging lots of hands and it's driving businesses. The quantity theory of money. So this uses the velocity of money, and the formula is MV equals PQ. 
and this tracks money movement in the economy. So M represents money supply, V the velocity of, of money as we just talked about, price such as different price levels, and Q as the quantity of money in this whole system. Positive supply shock. This is an unexpected increase in the availability of a key resources that temporarily increases productivity. So suddenly, let's say we have an increased supply of timber. So then you can suddenly start to make more benches and chairs. So this would be a positive supply shock. A negative supply shock, however, is an unexpected decrease in the availability of a key resource that temporarily decreases productivity. So right now, there is a very bad coronavirus update as I'm making this video, and the coronavirus has negatively affected the workers. So these workers in places like China cannot produce as many iPhones. So this, of course, would be a negative supply shock to the Apple manufacturing process. Stagflation. This is when there is high inflation and a sluggish economy. So this normally happens when we have an ASAD curve and the SRAS, the short run aggregate supply, shifts up and leftward. So in this case, you have a higher price level, but you also have less output. So this is really bad for the economy. And one example of this was in the 1970s during the oil crisis. We didn't have a lot of oil so the supply suddenly started to decrease and oil was very expensive and we also didn't have as much disposable income so this is the amount of money households have to spend or save after taxes this is the money that people really want because this is the money they can do whatever they want with and they're free to spend it however they want not subject to different types of taxes or government regulation and the classical economy theory. This is the belief that the economy will self-correct and that government intervention will do harm. So Herbert Hoover was a big proponent of this from 1928 to 1932, and eventually the Great Depression caught up to him, and it became clear that this was not going to work. Keynesian economic theory. So this is in contrast with the classical theory of economics, and it was started by this guy, British economist John Maynard Keynes. And his belief was that the government should actively manipulate the economy to reach full employment. And one of the greatest examples of this was in 1932 when FDR created a bunch of those alphabet soup programs to try to stimulate the economy and provide more employment. And people believe that most economists and politicians practice this today. It just depends on how far they are willing to go with government spending. Discretionary fiscal policy. This is when Congress creates a new bill that is designed to change aggregate demand through government spending and taxation. As we know, the government spends a lot of money and this can start to affect the demand in an, in an economy. And also taxation. So if the government starts to cut taxes, people will have more discretionary income and they can start to demand more goods and services. Non-discretionary fiscal policy. This is permanent spending or taxation laws that are enacted to work counter-cyclically to stabilize the economy. So if the economy starts to go down, these taxation laws will start to jump in and start encouraging people to start spending more to re-jumpstart the economy. Multiplier effect. This is the idea that an initial change in spending will set off a spending chain that will eventually help magnify the effect of that dollar in the economy. So the strength of the multiplier depends on the amount that consumers spend of new income. So if consumers are willing to spend more, they are going to have a bigger magnifier and a bigger multiplier effect. Marginal propensity to consume, MPC versus marginal propensity to save, which is the MPS. So MPC is how much people consume rather than save when income changes. So if people start to make more money, they might want to consume more. While if we have high taxes or we have a good interest rate, people might want to start to save more. And that's what the MPS measures. And altogether, MPC plus MPS equals 1. And 1 over MPS equals the spending multiplier that we talked about last time. Because, you know, if you're not saving money, you're probably consuming it. Deficit spending. So this is if the government increases spending without increasing taxes, they will increase the annual deficit and the national debt. Of course, they have started to spend much more money than the taxes are coming in, so they're actually losing money. And because of this, it's kind of like going in debt. 
let's say you want to like buy stuff on your credit card, but you're not making enough to pay this off. You'll start to go into a deficit and start to increase your personal debt. Well, that's it for this one. Please make sure to subscribe, like, comment, and share these videos with your friends. Part three is over here on the left and the full AP playlist is over there on the right. Thanks so much for watching and hope to see you in the next one.